Holy moly, Doc. That's about 24 inches. <laughs> when you're fishing, particularly if you're fly fishing, you don't have any time to worry about the economy or your car being repossessed or illnesses or anything. You're just concentrating on trying to get some crazy fish to take that lure and give you a fight. Today on This American Land. Conservation groups have been able to conserve over 10,000 acres of the most key habitats in the Green River Valley. Sometimes it's a hassle getting from your summer to your winter home. In Wyoming, a healthy compromise protects some crucial wide open spaces. This toxic legacy is not only affecting fish and the, the critters in our sediment, but also people. Shipyards and San Diego have always gone together, but decades of contaminants are taking a toll. How are the plants responding to being flooded more often uh, and, and at a greater depth? And rising sea levels could upset the delicate balance between salt and freshwater marshes. Can these plants and animals cope? Those stories and more, now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Turner Foundation, the Daniel K. Thorne Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust. Hi, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Bruce Burkhart. And I'm Caroline Ravel. On every show, we'll take you to some of the most beautiful places you may have never heard of, and we'll do something more bring you thoughtful stories about protecting America's natural resources. We have reporters from coast to coast covering water, wildlife, and conservation issues. Our first story today, some secrets of the dinosaurs are being uncovered in the deep canyons of the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument in southern Utah and northern Arizona. In the rugged canyons of America's last frontier, modern explorers search for signs of ancient history covering nearly two million acres of southern Utah and northern Arizona, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is attracting attention. Recent discoveries here date back 80 million years. What you're looking at here is probably a tibia. Scott Richardson spends half the year roaming the Kaiparowitz Plateau searching for dinosaurs. Over the past three years, he has discovered two new species of dinosaurs in the Grand Staircase Monument. These new species are creating new arguments about prehistoric Earth. It's begging the question of why did two groups of dinosaurs evolve separately? Uh, what cut off the migration routes that uh, led to their developing differently? On the opposite side of Grand Staircase, near Escalante, Utah, a team from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is educating school children in Denver live via satellite. We're actually experts in fossil plants. Ask them if they could hear him. They share with students discoveries that haven't seen the light of day since the Cretaceous period when giants roamed the planet. This is the only place in North America where the entire, almost the entire part of the late Cretaceous is exposed and continuous. So you have all that time uh, represented by the rock exposed in a single spot. Along with tourists and nature lovers, Grand Staircase Escalante is attracting the attention of the scientific world. Its status as a national conservation area guarantees a bright future of exploration for scientists. The potential is, is unlimited. There is so much to look at and so little time and so few people looking at it that it's going to keep paleontologists busy for 100 years. This is a huge 1.9 million acre laboratory. Everything from paleontology, ethnology, biology, historical resources, archaeology. It is a huge place um, with untapped resources all over the place. Deep canyons and breathtaking vistas captivated Grand Staircase, but for some, the experience of this place is even more profound. It's a real love affair for me. Um, it's a beautiful place. 
It's scientifically important. It's uh, still in the early phases of being discovered by the public. I think the world of this place. Scientific research on the monument ranges from dinosaur digs to bee research to NASA investigations, seeking insights into the surface of Mars. The ritual of fly fishing can be solitary, even spiritual. It can also instill a deep appreciation for clean air and clean water. Veterans of the sport create artificial flies that are works of art. They can mimic insects, small fish, even tiny reptiles. Sharon Collins from Georgia Public Broadcasting got a lesson from a true master. Rick Claridad has a special talent. He can throw a line in the air and make it land wherever he chooses. No easy task, since there's nothing at the end of that line but a little bit of fuzz designed to look like a bug. He is one of millions who practice the ritual of unfurling a weightless strand across the water. The point is simple. Pretend to be an insect and fool a fish. But when Rick and his fishing buddies get together, complexities emerge. It's like a special club with a secret language. Said, oh, you were with that guy that fished that rubber worm. Yeah. And these fly reels that were all magnetic, not a moving part, no springs, nothing. Now the only thing more expensive than fishing is chasing women. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he fishes little These men have made their way through many forests. They've walked down the banks of countless streams just to stand in the rapids and cast those lines. Enter the world of fly fishing. They may cast over and over again, but when it all comes together, when that moment arrives, this is Shangri-La. Good grief. Holy moly, Doc. That's about 24 inches. <laughs> oh, he's fine. Ah, oh, thanks, Doc. That was pretty incredible. That's a big fish. Wow. You can fly fish anywhere, including the ocean. But the streams and rivers that flow through Georgia seem to be a favorite. The anglers who fish them are as protective of the water as they are of the fish. Every fly fisherman says that trout only live in beautiful places. It really is true. That uh, trout are sort of like the canary in the mine shaft, uh, as far as water purity goes, that uh, if a trout can't live in it, it's not very pure water. So particularly the wild trout up here in North Georgia mountains, if it weren't for water purity and some of the uh, organizations that have worked really hard to fight for water purity, uh, we wouldn't have any native trout. And in the process, we wouldn't have any clean, pure water. Fly fishermen may study nature more than most. They pay attention to small details many of us miss. Success depends on how well you can imitate a bug. So knowing your insects is part of the game. Many fishermen, like Rick, make their own flies. His favorite, is the famous woolly booger. I think even though it's somewhat of a, a joke among fly fishing people, the very first fly most of us ever learned how to tie is called a woolly booger. If you haven't already figured this out, Rick Claridad lives and breathes this stuff. He seems in awe of the world around him and the fish within. Wow, look at that, little tiny sunfish. That common sunfish was the very first fish that I caught, and most everybody who's ever fished, that's the very first fish that any kid ever catches. Rick has owned fishing shops in Arkansas and Atlanta. He's taught the rich and famous. Say, don't let the, t the, the tip point back, look, stop it. Nice and smooth, look. 
just like that, okay? Oh, okay, wait. Right there. There you go. It looks so easy, there. but it's not. It noodled up there. Well, that's not bad at all, except we want to keep our elbow down, okay? <laughs> so we've got the rod down here to watch. It's a nice, crisp motion. You were here, and you needed to be here, so you were almost there. How long does it take for me to be able to say, I want to put that fly on a, on a rock? Well, how much you want to practice? <laughs> Rick was determined I would catch a fish. Elbow in, wrist at 1 o'clock, snap the line, strip the line. I tried. I really did. But those fish, like dogs who smell your fear, they knew. You got them. You got them. Oh, I got away. <laughs> One fish even swam under my line. Eventually, I had to take the walk of shame, over to the baby pond where they teach children. Even here, the fish laughed. One fish did take pity and grab my hook. <laughs> if only it ended there. But I invented a new sport, grass fishing. And another one got away. I take my fly and go home and tell everybody how big the fish was. Here's my excuse. Fly fishing is a bit like golf. Anyone can do it, but it may take years to do it well. About 130 state streams are stocked with brown, brook, or rainbow trout from places like the Lake Burton Fish Hatchery. Our water is almost it's so pure, it's almost to the point of being distilled. And uh, what happens is there's not a lot of insect reproduction, and uh, that's the main food source for trout in the streams. So you don't get a, lot of, uh, or a whole lot of fish reproduction. So to handle the amount of fishing pressure that we get from uh, our trout anglers, we have a restocking program. Georgia's trout stocking program dates back to the 1940s. But nationally, fish hatcheries have been around since 1872. Today, there are hatcheries in 35 states that provide more than 60 different species of fish. At least 160,000 anglers fish for trout in this state, and the Lake Burton Hatchery spends most of every year just trying to meet that need. Across the state, there are 18 rivers, 500,000 acres of reservoirs, lakes, ponds, and miles of ocean. Fly or spin, trout or bass, they hit the water armed with rods, reels, bait, and lures. The reasons for fishing are as varied as the fishermen themselves. With easy access to all of Georgia's parks, lakes, rivers, and streams, fishing may be one of the best ways to get outside and truly appreciate the natural beauty around you. Yeah, when you're fishing, particularly if you're fly fishing, you don't have any time to worry about the economy or your car being repossessed or illnesses or anything. You're just concentrating on trying to get some poor crazy fish to take that lure and give you a fight. And you know, that's what it is about fly fishing. And I mean, the more you go, the more you learn. I mean, it's all those experiences that add up. It's a real knowledge intense sport. So if you're looking for something to do, a way to relax, maybe just a way to escape, grab a rod and cast a line. You never know what you might catch. <laughs> for This American Land, I'm Sharon Collins. Some popular fly tying recipes include the slump buster, the kinky muddler, the rusty spinner, and the Moorish mouse. For centuries, coastal communities have relied not only on fishing, but also on shipbuilding. Shipyards are often important economic engines for a region. But the paints, the oils, the cleaning fluids, and all the other contaminants that are part of this industry can leave a toxic legacy like the one in San Diego Bay. The waters of San Diego Bay. There's abundant wildlife here, a tourist attraction set against the city's gleaming skyline, and the Coronado Bridge. Fishing attracts lots of people to the bay, but what lies below these waters is something that could be called San Diego's dirty secret. 
Underneath these waters, we have the legacy, a pollution legacy of decades of environmental pollution, largely due to the operations of um, shipyard work on our shorelines. Shipyards and San Diego prospered together for years. Most of the ships built here were made for the U.S. Navy, a huge presence on a base just across the bay. If not done right, building ships can be a messy business, which is why today the industry follows more stringent environmental rules than a few decades ago. Back then, shipbuilding practices were different. The chemicals come from, they come from paint that comes off the boats, they come from oil discharges, all the stormwater that might have come, been coming from the shipyards. Scientist Jennifer Kovexis says once ships left the shipyard, many of the chemicals used to build them stayed behind in the sediment below the surface. But it's different types of heavy metals, things like PCBs, some mercury, so a range of different types of pollutants. Covexis works for the San Diego Coast Keeper, a nonprofit group that protects the area's inland and coastal waters for the wildlife and people that depend on them. She admits that shipyard environmental practices have improved in recent years. In some ways, it has probably improved, but has not changed the fact that there's still pollution that needs to be taken out of the bay to keep the bay healthier. So, San Diego Coast Keeper has gone to the Regional Water Board to force a cleanup of the contaminated underwater sediment. They want the shipyards to pay at least part of the cost to dredge the contaminated silt from a 60-acre area near their facilities, claiming that relatively small area of contamination has a big impact on the bay's ecosystem. We know that the uh, wildlife can bioaccumulate, can take metals and other contaminants into their tissues. Um, there is some evidence that the, the internal workings, the physiology of some of the fish has been negatively affected. And this toxic legacy is not only affecting fish and the, the critters in our sediment, but also people. We have subsistence fishermen in our bay who actually feed their family from the fish that they catch. And they're feeding children, their wives in most cases, even pregnant women. That risk is really of concern to us. The cost of dredging out the dirty sediment could run close to $60 million. We asked one of the shipyards, NASCO, owned by General Dynamics, for comment. They declined an interview but sent this statement, which in part reads, NASCO is fully committed to continuing to work with the government agencies to develop a long-term solution to protect and preserve San Diego Bay. It is also important to note that the company has dedicated significant resources to improve the facility, constructing a stormwater diversion system that prevents discharges to San Diego Bay, and investing in a state-of-the-art water treatment system and a state-of-the-art recycling center. The Coast Keeper responds that clean practices today aren't enough, while yesterday's contamination remains untouched. Since the 90s until 2011, not one uh, iota of the bay has been cleaned up in the shipyards area. And that's really putting the bay at risk, and that's putting our community at risk. If the Regional Water Board votes in favor of Coast Keeper, the shipyards could appeal, and the case could still drag on for a long time. Efforts are underway to find effective, non-toxic alternatives to traditional copper-based boat paints. That's because of increased copper levels in water worldwide. Copper keeps many marine organisms from accumulating on boat hulls. Many birds and mammals need both summer and winter living spaces in order to find food and feed their young. But development can interfere with these habitats, especially for animals with long migration routes. In Wyoming, energy companies and conservation groups have figured out a way to protect these critical, wide-open spaces. Gary Stryker shows us how it's working. Western Wyoming's Jonah Field holds natural gas worth billions, and tapping this energy resource means industrializing 30,000 acres of public land. Jonah is a intensely developed field. There's a lot of activity in, in Jonah. And we felt, and Canna felt, that the responsible way to develop this field was not only to do the, the on-site reclamation, which we're required to do, but to also create an off-site fund. To make up for their impact, energy companies and Canna and BP 
put about $25 million into a unique fund. Using those funds, conservation groups like the Conservation Fund, the Wyoming Stock Growers, Land Trust, and others have been able to conserve over 10,000 acres of the most key habitats in the Green River Valley. Part of the fund pays for conservation easements to preserve open space by paying ranchers to give up future development rights, like here on the 12,000-acre Cottonwood ranches. Without the conservation easement, the property could be subdivided into 35-acre tracks and fences and horses and dogs and the associated impacts. An easement on another ranch now protects a 7,000-year-old migration path used by pronghorn. So by conserving the ranch, we know that it will remain open, intact, and available for wildlife and agriculture forever. Another easement on the Cottonwood ranches protects riparian and wetland habitat. These creekside corridors connect mountain meadows to the sagebrush steppe and are critical for wildlife. Most species, and sage grouse are one of them, um, have areas where they summer and areas where they winter. So maintaining some connectivity in fairly large um, expanses, you know, is pretty important. Biologists counted more than 250 sage grouse on the ranch in a single visit. Many of these conservation projects just simply wouldn't get off the ground if it weren't for industry dollars to help support them. While energy companies put up the cash, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management and three state agencies select and manage the projects. We want to prove up our success in our mitigation projects, and monitoring will be an important component of that. Many easements come with 20-year grazing plans to improve the range. Measuring their success will take time. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Wyoming is the second largest producer of natural gas in the United States. Jonah Field, located in the Green River Basin, covers an area of 21,000 acres. Coastal marshes play an important part in the health of both water and wildlife. They act as protective nurseries for young fish and crabs. Marshes also act as kind of speed bumps during intense storms. But sea level rise and climate change are causing problems in these ecosystems. Miles O'Brien has more in our Science Nation report. We're in uh, Raccoon Creek, which is a small tributary to the Delaware River. Villanova University marine scientist Nathaniel Weston studies salt and freshwater marshes. With support from the National Science Foundation, he and his team are investigating how climate change and sea level rise may impact these productive ecosystems. When you have sea level rise on the ocean end and potentially less fresh water coming down on the, on the river end, that's going to move the, the salt water up into potentially what had been a freshwater marsh. For the organisms living there, the plants, the animals, the bacteria, that's a, that's a big change. Weston says as the Earth's climate gets hotter, ocean water warms up and expands, causing higher sea levels. And runoff from melting ice sheets and glaciers will dump even more water into the oceans. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, chartered by the United Nations, estimates sea levels may rise up to 23 inches by the year 2100. It's tough, muddy work at the field sites. This is a surface elevation table, um, and what we'll do with this is very accurately measure the elevation of the marsh surface at a couple of set sites that we have out here, 151. Marshes are fairly resilient to change. They, they deal with a changing environment day to day and, and year to year, but the concern is that we're kind of pushing the envelope of what they can deal with. With sea levels rising, certainly one of the big concerns is, is will marshes be able to keep up with that sea level rise? What we're using to simulate different sea levels. How are the plants responding to being flooded more often uh, and, and at a greater depth? All right, putting it in is the easy part. Getting it out is always fun. In the lab, soil samples are weighed and dried. Weston wants to determine sedimentation rates at the sites he studies to learn more about how the marsh landscape is changing. 
The East Coast of the United States, though, has uh, really extensive marshes, tidal marshes like this, sitting at sea level. And so how they respond to changing sea level, we don't know, but there's, there's a fair amount of concern about how much marsh we're going to have left in 50 years, 100 years. He says more intense storms and hurricanes could magnify sea level rise in coastal areas. Lots of people are living close to sea level. They're going to be much more vulnerable to these extreme events. 50 years in the future, and you can expect to see much greater numbers of storm-related deaths and property damage in coastal areas. Healthy marshes act as buffers during a storm surge, nurseries for young fish and shellfish, and a water filtering system. Protecting them over time will be key to keeping us healthy, too. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. One of the stories we're working on for a future show. 10 4, go! You want some inspiration? Meet some speedy high school athletes in a challenging run in the stunning Eastern Oregon Mountains. Thanks for joining us for This American Land. Every week we'll bring you stories on issues affecting America's natural landscapes, waters, and wildlife. We'll see you next time. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Weiss Foundation. The Turner Foundation. The Daniel K. Thorne Foundation. The Pew Charitable Trusts.